Hello, coming to you guys from the Show Flow Studio, doing a talk on the Delphic Charioteer. Now, this sculptural group was found in the late 1800s by the French excavators at Delphi. The charioteer back here and just a couple of parts of this sculpture survived from a earthquake and landslide that happened in 373 BC. So we're very, very lucky that any part of this survives at all. We see here kind of the recreation of the four horses, the chariot and the charioteer. And then I think it's kind of interesting that Ubisoft decided to put the attendant and a horse over here to the side. It's just kind of extra decoration in the game. Now that attendant is actually thought to have been part of the group itself, maybe standing about here, holding onto the reins of one of the horses. Now Ubisoft did make this chariot team a little bit larger than it actually would be in real life. So if I kind of get my character up here in the chariot, behind our charioteer, you can see that they made him quite monumental. This charioteer in real life stands a little around six feet tall to give you a sense of the actual scale of this monument. Now this is also a really important sculpture because it shows us the early classical style in a bronze sculpture. We also call this style the severe style. So let's pop up here real quick and take a look at the figure. Do you guys see how the figure kind of looks columnar? He's a little bit rigid, and that is kind of a holdover from the archaic style. The face definitely on the original sculpture looks far more naturalistic. And so we can see that this is a very early example of the classical, where we still have some holdovers for the archaic style. And then we're moving into the classical style where things really start to loosen up. Now it is made of a very expensive material in the lost wax method. And then up at the top, around the charioteer's head and his teeth were details in silver. So bronze and silver for the making of this sculpture. The material, the size, and the placement of this were really, really important for the dedication of this monument. It would have shown off the wealth, the status, and the power of the man who won this game. So Polyzilus, who was a tyrant in Sicily, won the chariot race at the Pythian Games at about 478 or 474 BC. We're not quite sure as the dedication is a little bit damaged, but this whole monument would have stood on top of a plinth that would have had the dedication. Now, one thing that's important to note is that the person in the chariot is not Polyzilus. He would not have participated in this race himself. The chariot races were incredibly dangerous. Just think about something like Ben-Hur, you know, all these horses going around the racetrack, getting to the end of the racetrack and having to do a very quick turn. So in some cases, we're actually told that about 40 chariots could start a race and sometimes only one of them would finish the race. So you can imagine Polyzalis kind of being like, mm, I don't think I really want to be the one who actually goes and runs this race. And so the charioteer would have either been in his employment or possibly even a slave of Polyzalis's, as well as the attendant over here might also have been a slave. So my favorite example of a chariot owner winning a race versus the charioteer winning a race was a Spartan princess named Seneska. She won the Olympic games in 396 and also in 392. And so she actually had monuments of herself put up at Olympia to commemorate her victory. Now, as far as the horses are concerned, we don't have many examples of bronze horses from this time period. We do have a set of surviving bronze horses from about 150 years after this. Those are currently in St. Mark's Basilica in Venice. Now, legend tells us that these horses might actually be connected to Alexander the Great, but I'll leave that up for you to decide whether or not you like that legend or not. I hope you enjoyed our little visit with the charioteer of Delphi. We'll continue our tour around the rest of the sanctuary.